Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and there's nothing to lose but yourself. My guest today has been called the most famous astrophysicist of our time. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist and the author of the number one best-selling Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, among other books. He is the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, where he has served since 1996. He's also a two-time host of the beloved TV series, one of my favorite shows, Cosmos, rebooting the original 1980 series that was hosted by Carl Sagan. Uh, Dr. Tyson is also the host and co-founder of the Emmy-nominated popular podcast, Star Talk, and its spinoff, Star Talk Sports Addiction. Addition. Say that three times fast. <laughs> which it's also an addiction. It's also an addiction. Sports. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. That's great. Uh, which combines science, humor, and pop culture. Uh, he's a recipient of 20 won honorary doctorates, the Public Welfare Medal from the National Academy of Sciences, and the Distinguished Public Service Medal from NASA. Asteroid 13123 Tyson is named in his honor, and I am so grateful to welcome to the podcast today a New York resident and native, Dr. Neil Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I'm instructed I'm supposed to call him Neil, which you guys can understand. I'm uncomfortable with. I'm <laughs> going to suffer through this today. Neil Tyson, welcome to the podcast. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. And this bit about being the most famous astrophysicist, I don't know how many astrophysicist people know. <laughs> so <laughs> to be the most famous of the one, what you know, I, I don't, that's not really saying anything. That's all. I'm I got to tell you, I thought that when I read it, like, do I know any other? Past? Right, that's right. There you go. Not living uh -huh. ones, anyway. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been a busy man. I know you're a busy man. You've written this wonderful book, a story, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. You've got a new master class uh, on the master class platform, and you've done all these speaking engagements. So I'm just so grateful that you took the time to join me today and to share with our listeners. Um, before we dive in, though, I, many people know who you are and what you do now, but very few people know your upbringing, like where you're from and, and how you came to be who you are. Can you just kind of real top line, give us a... Okay, it's not hidden, but yeah, you can dig for it. So I'm born and raised in New York City, uh, attended the public schools uh, in the Bronx, and uh, I, I got to say the right, the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the yeah, Bronx. Lots of good things come out of the Bronx besides hip hop. Yeah, yeah, the, Bro the Bronx. Bye -bye. And I, right through high school, public schools, my high school was the Bronx High School of Science. Uh, among the more formative years of my life, uh, that's high school counts eight Nobel laureates among its graduates. Wow. And so that's quite a legacy that you feel while you were there. Well, when I was there, we, there were fewer than eight because some have come since I've graduated. Mm -hmm. But you feel that legacy. And if you're already academically focused, as I was as a kid, uh, it can do wonders for you and your ambitions. Um, then I uh, went to college, majored in physics. And then in graduate school, I got a PhD in astrophysics. And then I uh, went out for a postdoc, which is what you do when after your PhD, when you just, just do research. And mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the purest times of your life because you're not teaching. There's no administrative duties. It's just you and your telescope. In my case, your telescope, your data, your computer. And uh, while I was a graduate student and postdoc, I wrote my first two books. And this latest book is actually my 15th book. It's crazy. Wow. Is that how old I am? I don't, <laughs> I must be an old part. Time to write 15 books. My goodness. Uh, yeah. Books are a huge uh, investment. Now about five of them are with co-authors, five or six. Mm -hmm. So th the books wouldn't have otherwise been written if I didn't have um, co-authors joining me in those, uh, or we joined each other to yeah. produce those. But this latest book is uh, only just came out. And thank you for the mention at the top of the show. Uh, uh, that one I think is, has the most wisdom mm -hmm. from what I've accumulated throughout my entire life. Just not only just living as we all do, but living and seeing the world through the lens of a scientist. I've had a scientifically literate worldview from very early on. And I can just tell you the world looks different when you are scientifically literate. There are adults making decisions where you just have to tilt your head and say, what? Yeah. Like a dog hearing a high pitch. You Did you just say that? And I, as a kid, I would hear adults, you know, there was a, 
it was a comet that we had discovered with our biggest telescopes and was had coming around Earth. And I'd go outside. I knew all about it. And there's a full grown, I'm 14. There's a full grown man in the street with a sandwich board saying, the comet is coming. The end of the world is near. Repent now. And I said, you're a grown up. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 do you know, not know anything about the universe? We discover hundreds of comets a year. Do you not know this? And grown ups are in charge. They wield resources. So, so a life of these kinds of observations are collected in that latest book. But my early days, I was a geek kid, but I was also very physically fit. So for many boys in the era, we, you know, you had a dream of being a superhero, right? Mm -hmm. This was, some girls probably had that too, but was, but I, I knew most about boys. We'd sit around and say, what, what superpower would you want? Which superhero would you be? And there were many more examples of male superheroes than female superheroes. There's Wonder Woman, of course, and maybe a few others, but the, the male ones were way more famous, like Superman and Thor and Batman and <laughs> all of this. So uh, I wanted to be a superhero, a defender of geeks. <laughs> That's what I wanted to be. <laughs> so I, I imagine, uh, I fantasized, is probably the right word there, where there's a geek in trouble they're getting beaten up by like the football quarterback or something. And that was at least as big as the football quarterback, but I was a geek, right? So here's the magic superpower here. So you would beam the digits of pi into the clouds, right? Like the bat signal. And the more digits, mm -hmm. the more in trouble the person was. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a six digit call. This is a three digit call. And I would, I don't know, fly, I guess, and show up there. And I just kick some ass. Cause I also studied martial arts. As a kid, and I was captain of my high school's wrestling team. So then I'd be defender of the geeks, and the geeks could go about whatever it was they were doing. And all of that would change. And I remembered watching this happen slowly, but it happened where when computers entered people's lives, mm -hmm. all of the bullies and those who were beating up on the geeks, hanging us from the hooks in the locker room by our underwear, getting wedgied, um, that the they realized that they needed us to operate and fix their computers. <laughs> so, so we became a commodity rather than a punching board, right? And so, so the stock value of geeks rose in society. And the, the movie's Revenge of the Nerds was mm -hmm. right at about that time. And I gave a talk at my high school. I was invited to give a commencement speech in 2000, and I titled it Revenge of the Nerds because – all of a sudden, the nerds could invent things that were highly commoditized uh, and capitalized in our society. They could be heads of computer companies. The, Bill Gates, the patron saint of nerds, yeah. one of the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so my childhood and growing up was participating in this transition from geeks being abused by the cool people to geeks being praised by not only everyone in school, but also the financial markets. <laughs> uh, you have definitely saved the geeks, but I gotta, I gotta say, it's almost like a Star Wars trilogy. I'm kind of wondering now if it's like revenge of the the cool people going on right now. There's this wave of anti-intellectualism that's kind of in our society. Oh and yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so here's my read of that. And uh, we went through a period, and who knows when, early 2000s, 2010s. It was probably going on earlier, but maybe that's just when I first became aware, that the intelligentsia, all right, so the academic class, let's call them that, mm -hmm. that they would speak and say things, and if you didn't understand them, that was your fault, not their fault. And so I think the academics of all stripes, not only the science, but liberal arts and the mm -hmm. literary class, that they started painting themselves into a corner where they could only communicate with one another. And anyone outside of your cocktail party was not only not invited, they, would, they were shunned upon. Mm -hmm. Shunned upon, they were looked down upon. I'll give an example. I have an award on, on my shelf here. Mm -hmm. I think it's here. 
uh, I got the an award from the National Science Teachers Association (NSTA), and was that it, or the American Society of Physics Te- (AAPT) American Association of Physics Teachers? That's the one. Okay, I got an award, like a teaching award, but was no, wasn't so much for my teaching, but for my public um, exposure. All right, mm-hmm. and. I was honored by this. I attended the conference. There's, I give a little acceptance speech and I took a show of hands. This is now in the aughts. Okay. So maybe 2008, something like that. Okay. And I said, do I get to call those the aughts? I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what we were going to call One and aught three, you know, <laughs> that was like the way old people spoke from the 1900s, you know, yeah. uh, but in the aughts. Okay. Uh, I, I asked the room, I said, how many of you do not own a television? Half the hands went up. Okay. Then I asked, of those who own a television, how many only use it like to to see videos you rented or just watch PBS? Two thirds of those hands went up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And some small fraction left would watch TV avidly. Okay. So I told the rest of everyone, I said, you realize the people you're trying to teach watch TV 30 hours a week on average. Yeah. And you're going to, you have the audacity. I accuse them even without verifying this because I know it's true. I mean, no, it's true in general, whether or not it was true for them. I said, you're going to teach a class physics and at the end of the day say they just don't want to learn. Maybe... It's because you suck at your job. Okay. Maybe I didn't use those words <laughs> specifically. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> no, no. I may be a little more politic about that, but you cannot declare that you know how someone is going to learn unless you know what's going on in their head. Exactly. What are the receptors? What do they care about? What do they want to learn more of? What do they, if you don't know any of that, then how could you claim to be effective teachers? Mm-hmm. And I thought I was made myself very clear, but apparently not, because one of them came up to me afterwards and says, where is the research that shows that watching more television makes you a better student? I never said that. I said, if you watch more television, you could be a better instructor mm-hmm. because you have things you can draw from, from pop culture to make analogies and references. And this is what I do with my podcast. That the, the, the trinity of my Star Talk podcast is science, pop culture, and humor. Because if you learn while you're smiling, you'll come back for more. Absolutely. And the pop culture part is what everyone walks into the room with. Mm-hmm. You have a pop culture scaffold. And I look at the nodes of that scaffold. I say, there's a spot. I'm going to take some little bit of physics or chemistry and attach it there. And then you walk out and you have extra insights into what you already cared about. Insights brought to you by the methods and tools and the laws uh, of nature. Mm-hmm. And so I forgot why I went on that whole diatribe there. What did you we're what talking did you about talk? electoral into elitism and oh, and- elitism, right? Right. So, the thank you because I, I completely lost track. So, the elitism, I, I partly blame the elite mm-hmm. for that yeah. because they were simply inaccessible. I agree. And if you don't try to speak to the person in the inner city or the person in a trailer park in Appalachia, if you, if you don't try to, then you can think yourself better than they are. And we live in a free country with, yes, it's a meritocracy. I get that. But I think deep down, we're not supposed to be thinking we're better than other people. Absolutely. You might be more educated. But when you have the attitude that other people are not worth your time, then I think at least some parts of the intelligentsia had it coming. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, at least initially, and now, but it's a little more rampant and it's like cultural now. Mm -hmm. So I think we still have more work ahead of us. Uh, (laughs) Okay, a lot more. (laughs) I'll say this. I'll say this. A very wise man once said, it's not enough. To be right, you have to be effective. Yes, thank you. That's a quote from my father who told this to me. He worked hard in the 1960s and 70s in the civil rights movement, and uh, he has a degree in sociology, so he was all in. He was all in. And 
Yeah, you can sit there and say, I'm right and you're wrong and you're an idiot. And yeah, and with, how is the world better off for you having said that? Yeah. All right. What really? Really? Is that how you want to go? That's how, that's your day. That's how your day is going to unfold as you communicate with people around you. And so I, uh, so I have a, a different outlook on that. So I try to make it accessible, mm -hmm. accessible to people. I'll go on podcasts and talk shows that are, some are quite basal in their, <laughs> in their approach to, but I, I have a pretty low bar and people say, you shouldn't go on there. They're, they're Trumpists or they're this or they're, they think that earth is flat. And I'm saying, well, let me see what I can do about that. Maybe I can offer some insights or some wisdom or some, but you want to tribalize and not even have the conversation. Um, that is not, that does not, foster a better world all right and in many ways leads to the world that we're living in work. Right exactly exactly i sorry it's not only not a better world you make it a worse world mm -hmm. and i one of my mission statements personal mission statements is for the world to be a little better off for me having lived in it mm -hmm. you know on my on my deathbed that's all i would have asked of my life well, we and it. then there's that my favorite quote ever from Horace Mann, which I want on my tombstone, which is, I, I'll give the full quote. This is 200 years ago. People spoke differently back then. Mm -hmm. He began, he was an educator, and this is one of his commencement speeches, one of his last uh, as an educator. He said, I beseech you. See, I think we need that word back, don't you? Yeah, you need a word. <laughs> <It's> more beseeching. <laughs> not to be elitist, you guys. But yeah, not to be elitist, but it's a good word. I, it's, it's, it was, it's an educated word, indeed, but I think we need to bring it back. I beseech you to treasure up in your hearts these, my parting words. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Ooh. There it is. If you if you contributed to breaking humanity, then mm -hmm. I, that's no, no, you don't deserve that quote. And a part of it is how sel selfish you are. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you can create a country of people who are just selfish, right? That might work, I suppose. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. I don't think that's this country. There are parts of this country that our economic system, capitalism, is all is all about the self. OK, Absolutely. it's not really about others, but there's a point where it could be so much about yourself that the system that you're operating in collapses under your feet and then you end up with nothing. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you really better off with everything while you're stepping over homeless people to your mansion? Wouldn't you rather other people were better off as well if you had some influence or control over it? Maybe one of those homeless people could have been a chef that made very fine food that you could spend your millions, you know, some of your millions eating in that restaurant. Or someone else who's homeless could have been someone who created a new art museum where you can appreciate art. There are all manners of ways people can contribute to this world that will involve some kind of help to people up mm -hmm. that might need it. And are you better off if you're helping to create problems that you're then afraid of and having to protect yourself from? <laughs> Thank you. That, that's goodness. the corollary to what I just said, but it sounds way better the way you said it, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, are, you could have fixed this and you didn't, and now you're complaining that it's not fixed, mm -hmm. right? That's... And this myth anyway. of rugged individualism is it undergirds Western society and culture. Right, so right. That's a perfect that, sentence right there. Yeah. yeah it does mm -hmm. not serve us well. You have been busy. As we talked about, you wrote this amazing book, which we're going to get into in a second. But you also launched this masterclass, this class on the masterclass platform, uh, which is teaching us how to think like a scientist, which I think is more important than ever right now. I don't know how many people okay. you're going to get through to, but I think it's important. And before we dive in, I want you to, if you could, in the most uh, basic lay person's terms possible, kind of break down for people a definition of a couple of things I think are important for this conversation. One what is the scientific method and why should every single one of us consider trying to incorporate it into the way we approach our lives and, and the issues that we face? Yeah. The scientific method when fully explicated is kind of clunky. 
-hmm. It's like hypothesis, testing, experiment, deduction, and nobody remembers that sequence. And so I, I found another way to say the scientific method. All right. All right. Here it is. It's do whatever it takes to not fool yourself into thinking something is true that is not or that something is not true that is. That's the scientific method, I love period. And whatever it takes doesn't mean getting a chart recorder instead of you remembering it because memory has failure points. Is it uh, doing the experiment multiple times? Because if you only do it once, there could have been something you didn't notice that could affect it. Is mm -hmm. it getting someone else to check your results? Because you might be biased. Mm -hmm. There might be some outcome you're seeking and you're not even self-aware that you, you, you subtly influence the data. Get somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. All right, that would be the equivalent of peer review or, or, or someone else to check with a differently conceived experiment that's looking to the same test. So, so do whatever it takes. That is the scientific method. And when it survives the scientific method, it's an objective truth. Which is the second question to define for people what objective truth is and why it should be what we're searching for. Yeah, so objective truths are the – is – what and how society behaves mm -hmm. in ways that are not subject to your interpretation of how it behaves. So an objective truth, when it's established by the methods and tools of science, is true whether or not you believe in it, mm -hmm. whether or not you want it to be true, whether or not it upsets you, whether or not it offends you, an objective truth is what the methods and tools of science are exquisitely designed to establish. And once it's established, it's not later on shown to be false. Right. You can have deeper truths in which the previous objective truth is embedded. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, geologists knew that you get a volcano when magma gurgles up through the crust and it punches through magma, you know, lava, basically. Right. And it comes up, and it spills out, and it builds an island. Okay, so the Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands are examples of that. Okay. They didn't quite know why there'd be a chain of islands, but they knew it would come up. So this is a very local understanding of volcanoes. Right. And there's nothing wrong with it. It was tested. They verified it. We're good. Only when continental drift became established mm -hmm. and accepted, when we had sufficient experiments and data to show it, did they then understand that the hot spot under the crust itself does not move? The crust moves above the hot spot. The hot spot goes dormant and livens up again and punches another hole. And then the crust moves and it punches another hole. That's what archipelagos are. This is why there's the archipelago. It's a chain of volcanic islands. Mm. And why is it a chain? Because that is the crust of the earth moving over a single hot spot below it. So here was volcanism, which had a very local understanding that remained true in the larger understanding, but now we had a deeper sense of it. You didn't require multiple hot spots. It's one hot spot. Right. And so that's so so that's how you can take something that's well understood but embedded in a deeper truth. And there are plenty of examples in physics of this. So uh, objective truth. So in a pluralistic culture, society, if you're going to create laws and legislation, you really should base it on objective truths because they apply to everybody mm -hmm. rather than on, let's introduce here, personal truths. Yeah. All right. Uh, what, what's a personal truth? Uh, Jesus is your savior. No one in a free society is going to take that from you. And you feel that to your bones, all right? Mm -hmm. No one's going to stop that. In a free society, we have free expression of religion, as is guaranteed in our Constitution. All right. Mm -hmm. Here's the issue. If you have a personal truth and someone else's personal truth is Muhammad is their last prophet on earth, uh, someone else's truth, personal truth, uh, Beyonce is their queen, whatever, there are personal truths that are out there. And... 
the richness of views in society is empowered by everyone's personal truth. Mm -hmm. Problems arise if you require other people share your personal truth. That, requ that it requires some act of persuasion. In the limit, as the history of cultures have exhibited, outright warfare. Mm -hmm. That's what holy wars are all about. Oh, you, uh, Jesus is not your savior, but it's mine. I'm going to kill you unless you agree. Muhammad is not yours. I'm going to kill you if you don't agree. These are your personal truths. Mm -hmm. And so the moment your personal truth by law has to apply to someone else who happens to have a different personal truth, it's the beginning of the unraveling of a pluralistic society. And so I want people to recognize when they're, when they hold a personal truth versus when they hold uh, an objective truth. And by the way, scientists do not go to battle over objective truths. <laughs> <laughs> There's an old saying, if an argument lasts more than five minutes, then both sides are wrong. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you the sun is hot and earth goes around the sun. You're going to say, no, it's not. I will have walked away in the first five minutes. Or we talk and I convince you of the evidence of it, and now you understand the objective truths. So yeah. the well, there's another truth in there I call the political truth, yeah, I was which is something that. that's repeated so often you just believe it because it got repeated. And that's the foundations of, of um, Authoritarian what they're called. Authoritarian and dictatorships. Yeah, yeah, dictatorship, exactly. How do you get everyone to believe the same thing? You repeat it. You you have force by force or by, by just rep repetition. It's how you can get millions of Germans to be sure that the Aryan race is the number one race in the world. How, how does that come about? You got to tell them. And they kind of want to have to believe it, too. That helps in, a, in, a, in the propaganda of a political truth. And so uh, once you do that, right, if you're a poor white person and someone tells you you're poor and broke, but the black people are lower than you, you say, I'm going to believe that. Oh, for sure. That means I'm not the lowest thing. And then you're a little more content in your very low position in society, and you're not going to rise up against the other white people who have money. So how to keep an entire white underclass uh, uh, pacified? You create an underclass to them. And you have slaves and all the rest of this. And so the American South was an extraordinary example of political truths out of the repetition of of, of at the time, pseudoscience, and also just political will, uh, you create a stratified society because of it. And it's unfortunate. It's so efficient because the Nazis have leaned on a lot of our teachings to, to do what they did in Nazi Germany. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's not as widely publicized as it could be or should be. Mm -hmm. The eugenics movement, where they wanted to purify humans by selective breeding, uh, and which also means some people don't breed and others must breed only among themselves, right? Mm -hmm. They surely would have been happy a world without black people. However, black people were shining your shoes and cleaning your dishes and doing all this menial work. So they have to, you have to, you need a way to make more. You don't want to sterilize the black people. You, they have to make more of themselves. So you make a law that they can only breed with themselves. And that way they can make more and they'll still be available to you to do the menial work in society. This is all eugenics thinking, which was in the late, uh, in the 1890s, in the 19, the early 1900s and 1910s around there into the 1920s. Meanwhile, Hitler is reading this, right? This probably this is centered in the United States, Europe too, but especially the United States. In my home institution, the American Museum of Natural History, we hosted eugenics conferences here. Okay, I'm coming, I'm in my office now in that institution. Hosted eugenics conferences. So Hitler's reading this. It's, oh my gosh, yeah, your Germans are pretty badass. And all I have to do is tell them that they'll totally want to believe it because they were very, they were humiliated after the First World War and they need something to lift up and feel good about being German. Bam, there it was. Happened fast. 
Yeah, it doesn't take much. And it's happening here in many ways when you think about it. You know, no one wants to admit, for instance, that our economic system, the way it was built, uh, the exploitative nature of it, uh, and the way manufacturing has now been lost because of automation, not just other people, but because of automation. Now you have to have scapegoats and distractions to get away from that. So now all of a sudden the immigrants are the problem um, or the LGBTQ. Well, trans people, right. I mean, yeah, just pick something that everyone can refocus on. Yeah, that's been my my great disappointment with election cycles, where every election cycle, somebody decides what the single issue is that everyone uh, is inflamed about rather than the broader spectrum landscape on which politics unfolds. And so that tells me again that other people are telling you what you should think and what you should care about. In, in my book, I quote a line from the from a Mr. Porter's song, I think it's called, and in the in um, HMS Pinafore with Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm-hmm. So it's a simple line. They said, uh, this is some, some high-ranking British uh, person, but he's very humble, right? And he's just kind of just looking around at the world unfolding around him. And he says, and I quote him there, in the, it's in the song, I've always voted at my party's call. I've never thought of thinking for myself at all. There it is. And that's where we find ourselves. And quite often people are doing it against their own personal best interest. As so I saw, I saw, I knew, I'll tell you the moment I knew Trump was going to win in 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, the moment I knew it was, uh, was it 20? Yeah. yeah. 2020. Well, 26. No, 2016. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. 2016. In the camp, that's the campaign year for the 2016 election. Mm-hmm. So uh, CNN is somewhere in the Southwest. And there's a woman on this ranch, and they ask her, well, who are you going to vote for? He said, I'm voting for Trump. And they said, don't you know that he, like, grabs pussies and he's misogynistic? And she said, I know he's an idiot, but at least he's our idiot. And I said, okay, there it is. (laughs) That's the election right there, okay? Um, And it's just the you, you vote for your party's call. There it is. Yeah, and it might be. Let other people do your thinking. Uh, there's a whole part. There's a whole chapter in that book on this. Uh, it's on um, conflict and resolution, and the Republicans and Democrats, you know, left wing, right wing. And I just throw up some tropes that have been that are lobbed at each other, mm-hmm. and then I unpack them scientifically, and you see that these are just things people made up just to so they have something to fight about. Rather than find the things that people have in common so you get the business of the country to move forward. So, yeah, the book is not about me offering opinions. It's about you analyzing your own opinion on this. Yeah, and understanding where that comes from. You touched on something earlier when you you talked about how willingness to believe the thing is the fuel that actually adds to that fire. Yeah, yeah, that's and it's potent fuel. I mean, you can you can get people to believe it even without that fuel. It just takes longer, mm-hmm. right? And, and by the way, where does it come from? We know, you know, in the pl- plains of the Serengeti, where, wherever we were evolving, if you saw something repeat, all right, the lion chases the zebra, it catches it and eats it. Lion chases the zebra. There's there's a lesson in there because you saw it repeat. It was not a one off. Mm-hmm. So maybe if it chases me, it's going to catch me and eat me, right? So you can deduce things and so so arriving at what you are sure is true based on repetition had very good survival value if you go back you know tens of thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years but in modern times you're no longer being chased by a lion so this survival feature has been hijacked by uh by politicians, but especially by propagandists. Mm-hmm. Let us, we know this is, there's this urge inside us to see something repeat and think it's true. So let's repeat this slogan. Let's repeat this thing. Let's repeat this. And it just simply becomes true. And the irony of that is the repetition is the key. So even when you're standing in opposition to it, the very act of repeating it, even in opposition, reinforces the truth. Correct. Right? And I Correct. Think that's what we're missing. That both and sides- it's, it's it was a survival wiring of our brain that is now leaves us susceptible. 
yeah. to nefarious forces. I want to dive a little bit deeper into the book. By the way, you guys, here's the book. It is. Oh, thank you for holding it up. Yeah. Ari Messenger, Cosmic, Pers Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Once again, I want to say I love oh, By the way, just I got to call it out. That cover shows the Western Hemisphere. But if you turn over the book, there's the Eastern Hemisphere. Okay. <laughs> the rest of the Earth is there. So that's the entire Earth at night so that you can see where the lights of civilization populate the continents. So. It's, yeah. it's a great book. Uh, and I just want to ask you a question about the book. What does it mean? And I think we've touched on it, but let's really get specifically into it. What does it mean to experience and see life and view life from a cosmic perspective? And why is it so important, particularly in this moment that we inhabit right now? I, I won't tell people what should be important in their lives. I want them to deduce that on their own. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're handing people their thoughts rather than offering them information that they can then take ownership of Valid. so that when they have new thoughts, it's their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. All right. So I don't want somebody to say, this is true because Tyson said so. No, then I failed as an educator, at least in my own measures of myself. Mm -hmm. But if you say, if they say this is true and someone says, well, why? Well, here's why. And I'm not even in that conversation as a reference point. Then I know I've succeeded. Mm -hmm. All right. I've succeeded when everyone has forgotten about me. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> So, so now I'm sorry, your question specifically That's was about, oh, a cosmic uh, perspective. So you can go into orbit, Earth orbit, and you get what's called a, what has been called an overview effect, mm -hmm. where astronauts have, they've changed, right? They see Earth, it's very different as you sail over it with 18 sunrises a day, right? Because they orbit once every hour and a half. And I think I did the math right on that, so 6, 12, 18, 24. I'm going to trust your math because my ah, math ah, would never ah. <laughs> be up to par. I think it's 16 sunrises a day, but I have to check check my math on that. But it's around there. It's many more than one sunrise a day. All right. So, uh, and the sky is above you eternally. I mean, it's always dark, even when the sun is in the sky. So this outlook is can change you. But what I'd rather do in this in response to your question is take it up a notch mm -hmm. and go to the moon. Because, by the way, in a school, I have a schoolroom globe right here, by the way. I don't, some people might be only listening to this podcast, but I'm now holding a schoolroom globe. It's about a foot across. Mm -hmm. And so you can picture this in your head. And I, you can ask, well, how high up are the astronauts orbiting relative to a schoolroom globe? And it turns out they're orbiting about a centimeter above the surface. Got it. And the Bezos and Branson billionaire boys space race Mm -hmm. where they went up and fell back to Earth, they go up the thickness of two dimes, maybe a dime and a half above the surface. So as an astrophysicist, when they say, do you want to go into space with the... I, no, that's not space to me. I don't want to boldly go where hundreds have gone before. That's not space. <laughs> Send me to the moon, Mars, and beyond. But if you go to the moon, there's Earth, the entire sphere adrift in darkness and it doesn't look like the schoolroom globe with color coded countries it's as nature intends you to see it with oceans and land and clouds and so i uh, so to encapsulate what that does to you mm -hmm. what i will do is quote astronaut edgar mitchell all right in fact the book opens with his quote it does. The quote is so potent. I didn't. I, part of me thinks I didn't have to write the book. Just read the quote and then go home. That's because the, the quote is potent. It's a great quote. He says, "You develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it." From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and by the way, when he went up to the moon, we were still in a cold war with Soviet Union and a hot war in Southeast Asia. There was campus unrest. We were still winding down a little bit from the civil rights movement. There was you know, campus shootings. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And you rise above it all. Once you have that outlook, it's inconceivable that you would take arms against another human. 
because that earth is all you have yeah. in the entire universe. That's all you have. So yeah, that's a cosmic perspective for you. Yeah, that's important perspective. That's why, you know, I do the podcast because I think so much of why we treat each other the way we treat each other is because we fail to go inside and, and grasp the, the wonder that is just being a human being who's alive. We like to all think that we're individually so special, but what makes us special is that we are humanity and together. We are all a species. And by the way, as a species, we're genetically connected to all other species of life on earth, mm -hmm. biologically and genetically. We have genes in common with all other life forms on earth. In fact, here's one for you, just to you sleep on this. Mm -hmm. um, the common ancestor between humans and mushrooms split later in the tree of life than its common ancestor split from green plants, which means humans and mushrooms are more alike genetically than either humans or mushrooms are to green plants. My just God. chew on that. I might be and and, and speaking of literally chewing, uh, you know, we've all bitten into like a portobello mushroom. Mm -hmm. And what's a common word people use to describe it when they say, what do they say? Well, no, it doesn't, doesn't taste like, it tastes meaty. Yeah, right. Yeah. It has a meaty texture. And that is, no one has ever said that of kale. <laughs> <laughs> and never will. My and, and never will. Okay. So maybe part of that is we're biting into ourselves. Just a little part of it. <laughs> Perhaps that's why I don't enjoy mushrooms. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's, too, it's too cannibalistic for it's you? Too cannibalistic for me. All right. Uh, in the book, in chapter seven of the book, is a great example of your cosmic perspective and scientific way of viewing things, really kind of opening up uh, people's eyes and hearts to a new way to discuss some of the issues of the day. This chapter, you give a compelling explanation, um, as compelling explanation as I've ever seen, of how the human brain functions and our need to compartmentalize data and such. And you said- oh, Which chapter is that now? The chapter seven, when you talk about- oh, What's the title uh, gender, of it? Gender and- Oh, uh, gender and identity. Yeah. And uh -huh. identity. It's profound. And the, particularly the uh, examples you give, in the, you give in the beginning to kind of set up the conversation where you talk about the color spectrum or quibit examples, both are great examples. Just choose one and just kind of unpack for us why the brain does what it does and its ramifications on things like gender and our discussion of those topics. Yeah, it's not only gender, also on what we call race. Mm -hmm. So the race example is, is, is quicker. I'll start with that and then go straight to gender. So what we have come to recognize of ourselves as a species is we have the urge to compartmentalize, to put information in bins, all right? And then we just think about the bin as though everything is the same. And this gives us fewer things to think about. So in a way, it's intellectually lazy mm -hmm. to think of things in bins, in compartments, rather than on a spectrum. So uh, take, for example, uh, a crime is committed. Uh, let's say there's a robbery or something. And so the person who's robbed reports to the police. And they say, please describe the perpetrator. And after they get through the height and maybe the weight estimates, they'll say, well, was the person black or white or Asian or Hispanic? or?" And, well, wait a minute. This, we're, the police are about to track down someone who committed a crime. And the extent of the information you're handing them is four categories of people, black, white, Asian, uh, uh, Hispanic, really? Is that the best you can do? Really? Because so what you've done there is categorized. We've mm -hmm. we compartmentalized. The whole spectrum of humanity is put into these four bins, and the police are going to use this to track someone down. So if someone said it was a black man who did it, then I get stopped, no matter what the black man looked like. If his skin was much darker than mine, much lighter than mine, I get picked up because I'm in the bin that has been established mm -hmm. out of the intellectual laziness of our species. Now, are we capable of better than that? Yes, we are. Is there evidence of this? Yes, there is. Just walk into any pharmacy. Go to the hair color aisle. And there's a hundred boxes of hair color there yes. for women. And every box has a different model, modeling a different hair color that has a different name. Mm -hmm. There's also a code, which is more precise, but there's a name. It's autumn wheat or cinnaberry or whatever. We have names for things that go beyond four 
colors? Of course we do. And the limit of that is the interior decorator. Do you realize that Benjamin Moore paint has 150 shades of white? I do. These are colors that have the word white and an adjective in front of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking the future of policing should be, oh, ma'am, can you describe your the perpetrator? Uh, what, let me get my interior decorator. <laughs> and they open up the book, and they just point to the skin color that comes closest. Well, what this would be brilliant. That would The police would want that, okay? Yeah. To, to narrow down the skin color or what the, okay, if it is a range in the skin color, all right? And have hair color, point out to the hair colors. So that's an example where we, I know we have done it mm -hmm. in these other restricted ways, but we have not done it for just identifying perpetrators to the police. So that's one point. Now let's, let's move into the, the gender. So uh, let me give another example of how we bin things. Uh, hurricane strengths. You realize hurricane strengths are a continuum of wind speeds. Continuum. But we divided it into five categories. Category one, category two, category three. Now, categories, so hurricanes are a continuum of strengths. Mm -hmm. but watch what happens in our brain. We don't think on a continuum. We're thinking in these bins now. So what happens? Hurricane Irma goes from low category three to high category three. Fine. They might say, Hurricane Irma strengthened today. All right, right, fine. But the moment it goes one mile an hour over, tips into category four, it is breaking news. News break. Uh, Hurricane Irma is now category four. It was, oh, oh, oh. So, so the you fact that the we've been it still a hurricane. Affected our reaction to the information, mm -hmm. and so so this is so now let's go to gender. Yes, we have X Y and X X chromosomes, all right, and some rare variations on those pairings. All right, uh, so with some are called intersex, and there are others. Biologists have terms for it. Let's focus on just this binarity here, X X S Y, just for my next example. Mm -hmm. All right, that is binary. It is unambiguous. One of them makes male babies. The other makes female babies. Okay? Got it. Fine. Now, let's ask the question. Do you see these chromosomes when you look at somebody? Do you? All right. No, no. Let's watch. All right? If you think you do, well, let's, let's perform that experiment, which I did. I'm sitting in the subway, and I'm looking at people seated in front. It's in the winter. Everybody's got a heavy coat on. I just see heads. All right? And I ask myself. Can I, just by looking at someone, know if they're male or female? The answer is yes. It was completely obvious. Why? Because all, the girls, all right, you're comparing girls and boys here. What, did, what, what How did I know it was a girl? Because on average, they wore two earrings instead of one or none. On average, the earrings were longer, a little more dangly. On average, their hair was longer. On average, they were wear, wearing eye makeup, eyeliner, mascara. On average, their eyebrows were tweezed, okay? There was no hair on their upper lip. Even if they might have had hair on their upper lip, they they, they gets removed by laser, whatever the laser thing is that, that kills the, the hair follicles. What else? Oh, okay, uh, more likely to have painted fingernails. You add all of this up. That was a girl. God. What else? She's wearing girl clothes. Now, how do you know whether they're girl clothes? Because you go in the growth, the department store and they is a girl section. They will dress you how you're supposed to look if you're a girl. How, oh, what happened? Suppose your chest wasn't big enough to show up under your clothes. Go get breast augmentation surgery, as 200,000 American women do each year. Now I see that's a girl. Okay, well, how about the boy? Boy might have a beard, a mustache. That's a manly thing to do. Suppose you were kind of skinny. You go to the gym, build your muscles so that you can show people that you're a boy. You're okay? 
And how about the clothing you're wearing? You go to the boys section of the department store. They know how to dress you. My point here is, at no time am I looking at your chromosomes. I'm looking at secondary and tertiary forces operating on your expressed gender. Hmm. Now, in a free society, because somewhere I read, I thought I read this, didn't I read this? Uh, pursuit of happiness? What, was that in our in our Declaration of Independence? I thought I read that. All right. A free country where you have pursuit of happiness. If today I want to show myself as 80% female, 20% male, I know how to do that because I know what the makeup will do. And I know what, I know what clothes to wear. Mm -hmm. I want to be 80% male, 20% female. I know how to make that happen. And we know such people exist and walk among us. Go back to elementary school. There was the tomboy in every class had a tomboy. This is a girl who's not wearing a skirt, who's wearing pants, probably had short hair, got dirty in the mud with the boys. Okay. Might even gotten into a fist fight. Because there's that set of years where the girls are bigger than the boys. And they can kick your ass if they wanted to. They had the okay? boys for a long time. Eh? Okay. <laughs> Ideal place for the tomboy to like, all right. So, and there might have been a boy who's a little effeminate who didn't want to, the, all right. This is part of the spectrum of expressed gender that mm -hmm. we know has been there with us from the beginning. All I'm saying is that if a person feels that they are on a spectrum, and express themselves as such differently today than yesterday, or even the same, then, and I'm happy, why, why does that upset you? What, 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 no, you're either a boy or you're a girl. See, that's the, this is the brain not allowing the, mm -hmm. all right? So I am not going to cha change myself to fit into your limited capacity to think about gender. Mm. You have a lip, you have to recognize that you cannot think about this, that wait, let me be more kind and say, we all have challenges thinking on a spectrum. We do. We do. Okay. So just recognize at least intellectually, if not emotionally, that gender expression lands on a spectrum. And there are people who are not going to change their lives to satisfy your two bins that you have created for us. Now, the pushback would be what science says you're born male or female. And the yeah. understanding needs to be also what is sex versus gender versus sexuality? Because I think that yeah. gets blurred for people too. No, no, science I don't have, th th this is trivial. No, th fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, the, people are acting like this is some deep, deep, conversation that we have to have the United Nations look into, all right? My point is, if you only want to identify people by their chromosomes, then figure out a way to know that. But you know something? You can't know it because everything we do to ourselves overrides the chromosomes. Yeah. The flat-chested woman with a mustache and a unibrow you're going to think is male because that's how you've defined it. But she's going to tweeze her eyebrows, get the surgery, get the debil depilatories, whatever that is, so that she looks female. Because somebody defined what looking female looks like, and it was not the chromosomes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Period. So, yeah. So, so fine. What, do you want to brand on people's skin what their chromosomes are? That, to satisfy your inability to think, no, that's not going to happen. Not in a free country. Not in a free we've, country. we've seen where branding leads to in South Africa and in Germany. All right. No, no, no we're not going to do that because this is America. Last I checked. All right. So now you're going to say, oh, well, what bathroom do they use? Well, we can solve that instantly by having unisex bathrooms as nearly every bathroom in New York City is right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. You fix it. Boom. Nobody has to have that conversation again. All right. Uh, what else? Okay. Um, oh, sports. You're worried about sports. All right. We're still figuring that one out, but is it really intractable? Is it really? Because if we find out that your performance 
is I'm making this up, but just it's plausibly in our future that maybe our performance is is hormone driven, okay? Mm -hmm. Testosterone relative to to estrogen, whatever. I don't know what the relevant hormones are for building muscles or 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 grace or flexibility. So maybe we no longer contest separate genders. Maybe we contest intervals of hormones. And that's the category. Yeah. It's no longer the boys are over here and the girls are over here. Do you have this much testosterone? This much, that's a category. Let's watch that. You have this much over there. That's another category. Do you know there'll be too many categories? No, it won't. I used to wrestle. As a wrestler, how does a I weighed 190 pounds at the time? That was 45 pounds ago. <laughs> how, 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 how does a 200 pound wrestler wrestle a 120 pound wrestler? They don't. We have categories. Right. There were 10 weight categories in wrestling, and that constitutes the, the, the tournament. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, you want an interesting matchup where you're not always obvious who's going to win. That's why we watch sports. You don't watch college football on Saturday saying to yourself, you know, the best college team there ever was would collapse under the talent in the worst NFL team there ever was. Said more bluntly, the worst NFL team ever assembled could wipe their ass with the best college team ever play. Why? Because every person on every NFL team was the best college player their year. So but, so, but you're not saying, well, they would suck against the NFL. You just want a good contest. And then Sunday comes and you watch the NFL and you want to see a good contest. You don't want to see the NFL play at college. That's not, that's not interesting. So, so there might be a way to, to, to you get your hormones measured. And, oh, if you, if you want more, more steroids, okay. And I don't know if that's, it's probably not allowed, but imagine the steroids are part of your hormonal balance mm -hmm. and more steroids gives you more muscles. So that's a new category. The steroid hormone category. So I don't know how that will ultimately settle, but I don't fear. I don't fear this. And what are we doing today? Interestingly, let's go to woke Hollywood. Um, is there a category of best female director and best male director? No, it's just best director. It's best director. So then why the fuck is there best female actress and best male actor? Why is that split? If you're going to really be woke and gender spec and all of this, forget the gender. Just best actor. Best actor in a spy role. Best actor in a, you split out the category. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of fun. Best actor in a rom-com. Okay? It's then you're not funny. asking what their gender is. They could be trans. None of that matters. Mm -hmm. You're only judging how good an actor they are. Yeah, we so there are other categories that'll 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 get revisited as we move forward, for sure. But so in that chapter, I simply highlight the hypocrisies or the inconsistencies that exist as people move forward. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to end. I just wanted to talk about that hypocritic oath that you oh, that that. I think everybody should take. <laughs> yeah, everyone should need to take a hypocritic oath. When you look at it, we're all on our soapboxes fighting for these things, arguing on both sides of the things, and then quite often being very much hypocrites in our own day-to-day -day existence. Correct. And the hypocr hypocritic oath is I, I shall not hold views uh, of others that I do not hold of myself or something. I, it's, per it's more perfectly worded in the book. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you. I could talk to you for another hour, but I know your schedule oh. <laughs> will not permit. <laughs> yeah, no, I got, yeah, I have a very tight day today, but no. Yeah. I but again, you. thank you for your interest and for your, the attention you've given to the book. It's my, by the way, most of what's in the book, any scientist, physical scientist trained in the physical sciences would have exactly all of those thoughts mm -hmm. because it's, I'm looking through the same lens that we've all been trained to look through. Yeah. And it's, it's a lens of whatever is your view, let's analyze it from every possible direction and find a possible reason why it might be false. Mm -hmm. We do this not only with our own ideas, but with each other's ideas. 
That's how you know you get respect from your colleague because they're trying to find out why you're wrong. Right. That's the highest level of respect they can give you because you might have missed it. And you don't want to go out there with your bias manifest and have somebody else show it. No, you are biased. And that'd mess, that'll mess with your career. All right. So uh, all of these thoughts people have get fully analyzed. Neil. <laughs> See, I did it. I did it. I did it. I called you. Neil, Neil thank you. <laughs> but well, uh, Last quick one. I got to throw it in there because we're talking about gender. Another tomboy, famous tomboy was Joan of Arc. Oh, yes. All right. Joan of Arc. Joan. Oh, my gosh. Joan of Arc. You know, she's burned at the stake and ask people, why was she burned at the stake? Uh, most people I noticed most people don't know the reason. All right. I read the trials. All right. And there's an interesting French a short movie, like a half hour called The Trial of Joan of Arc. And it's it's acted. It's like a docudrama. Mm -hmm. um, and nearly half of the citations against her by the Catholic Church was for cross-dressing. That's why she was burned at the stake. Cross now, you can't lead soldiers into battle, which she did, wearing a skirt, riding side saddle on your horse. All right? So, yeah, you're going to have to don some male clothing there. All right? And I bet many men didn't even know she was a woman at the time. I'm betting. Or, I mean, I don't have care. all the details. Or What's care. that? Or care. Or, or care. She's bold and, and, and audacious and, and brave. There it is. There it is. And so... um. Oh, so 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 why would you burn a mistake for cross dressing? Well, it's clearly that way in the Bible, in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Uh, and I'm almost verbatim here, as I say. Um, a man shall not don the clothes of a woman, nor a woman the clothing of a man, lest this be an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Clear as day. So here's what happens. So a church can invoke that. Because the church was ruling society at the time. But in a free society, oh, by the way, they would later recant that and then turn her into a saint, all right? Um, but in a free society, if you're getting a rule out of a holy book that you hold dear as your truth, that's your personal truth. Mm -hmm. You can't now take your holy book, not in a free society, take your holy book, get a rule written in your holy book, and then apply it to someone else and exercise judgment upon them. No. Particularly this is, when you're not living by all the rules in that holy book to begin with. That's a, that's a separate conversation, yeah. right? Yeah, one of them is that you have to stone your children if they disrespect you. We, we've we've matured beyond beyond many of the rules that are in the book, mm -hmm. because rational analysis tells us that not everything there is what we should carry into the modern world. So, but that's a that's a different conversation. I'm being very specific mm -hmm. about you have a holy edict and you rise to power if you put that holy edict in a law that it now applies to people who don't share your holy edict that's the unraveling of a pluralistic democracy absolutely we've shared a lot of doom and gloom i want to leave us on a hopeful note what is happening in the world dr tyson that we should be excited about and happy about as you say goodbye to us today i think discovery is still underway Mm -hmm. I think self-driving electric cars is on our horizon that will save 40,000 lives a year. By the way, it'll kill people en route to it because there'll be bugs in the software and this sort of thing. And this will be a difficult transition because we'll go from 40,000 people a year dying because people are drunk on the road or texting or applying makeup or doing things that are distracting to self-driving that is never distracted, but there could be a bug. Like you come up over a hill and there's a sunset and it floods the detectors and it doesn't see yeah. a person crossing and you kill a pedestrian. This is going to happen. But we, no, we analyze how it happened. You fix the code, upload the software to every car in the road. That will never happen again. So we're going to go from 40,000 deaths to, let's say, 5,000. All right. And all 5,000 will be from self-driving cars. And that's bad. But you know something? No one writes news articles about the 35,000 people who didn't die. Yeah. All right. That nobody writes about that. And so it's going to be a hard transition as cars kill us, even if they kill many more, fewer of us than we do. Eventually that'll go to zero. And I look forward to that future. I don't have as much fear of AI as some AI experts. So maybe you should listen to them instead of me. Mm -hmm. I see AI is, yeah, it'll take some of your jobs as technology has always done. So you have to be flexible coming out of college. You have to not think of college as I'm going to learn something that I can apply to a job. 
at that level, college is a trade school, all right? You need to learn how to think so that you can adapt to new ways of thinking depending on what comes down the pipe. And so I see AI is making our lives better, more efficient, um, where we can end up living longer as it discovers new cures, as it'll do things that the human mind and previous computing power was unable to do. So, yeah, yeah it'll transform civilization. I like that. And we need checks and balances to make sure evil people don't gain control of it. But that's not uniquely new need, all right? When we develop nukes, you don't want nukes getting into the hands of people who are nefarious or who have, you know, yeah. evil motives. It's true for practically any major new technology. So we'll just take our cue from what had happened before and make sure we retain control over the power uh, that science and technology has given us. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for... Uh for shedding some light on these really dark and important topics. Uh, and the book, once again, you guys, is Starry Messenger. Uh, you want to pick that up anywhere you want to, Amazon, bookstores, locally. All and that, that ends on a very happy note, I want to add. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to share that, too, because it does end on a happy note. I'm and, pretty sure, last I checked, it was a happy note. But And also, uh, there's a new master class available. That we're oh, yeah, so that actually, I recorded that a few years ago, but it, it goes through waves of, of marketing from the company, but that contains all of my wisdom of how I communicate with people and how I teach. And so it's, if, if, if I had a hood in the old, I mean, a automotive hood, it's what I'm doing under the hood. All right. Uh, it's the machinery that leads to what I say, what I do and how and why I do it. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, insightful, and I think it's going to help a lot of people who watch it. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Right, Neil Tyson. Uh, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Go check him out on social media. What's your social media, by the way? Because uh, it's Neil Tyson on Twitter. Because I didn't want to waste the whole DeGrass on the on the, on the the letter real estate, which was precious <laughs> on Twitter. It's Neil Tyson on Twitter. Neil DeGrass Tyson everywhere else on TikTok and and Instagram and Facebook. And I leave one out. I think, I think those are the important ones, especially yeah, the, yeah, the big ones. The big four. He's on TikTok. He's doing better than I am. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm on TikTok. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks That's again for joining point. us. Thank Neil you. DeGrasse Tyson. All right.